Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vector Institute Temergy Clinical AI Integration Grant Information Session. My name is Ariana, and I am the Center Manager for the Temergy Center for Artificial Intelligence Research and Education in Medicine. For short, we call it TCARM. At this time, let me introduce you to two TCARM research colleagues who will speak to you about the grant. We, so on the call with us, we have Dr. Anna Goldenberg, who is uh, the research co-lead at TCARM. Dr. Goldenberg is trained in machine learning uh, at Carnegie Mellon University with a postdoctoral focus in computational biology and medicine. Her research is currently focused on developing machine learning methods that capture heterogeneity and identify disease mechanisms in complex human diseases, as well as developing risk prediction and early warning clinical systems. Dr. Goldenberg is a recipient of the Early Researchers Award from the Ministry of Research and Innovation. And also with us, we have Dr. Jai Masri, uh, who is also the research co-lead at TCARM. Dr. Masri completed his cardiology and critical care fellowship at Children's Hospital in Boston uh, with the Harvard Medical School. His clinical appointments are as a staff physician in cardiology and critical care medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children. His research roles include the William G. Williams Directorship in Cardiac Analytics and co-leading the AID, Artificial Intelligence in Medicine, initiative. He also directs the Clinical Translational Engineering Program in Critical Care that aims to create translational technical infrastructures that drive gains in clinical inference and patient outcomes. Also with us today, we have representatives from the Vector Institute. We have Roxana Sultan, who is the Chief Data Officer and Vice President for Health. We also, also have Azra Dalla, who is the Director for, for Health AI Implementation. And we have Deval Pandya, who is the Director of Engineering. And I'm going to hand it off to Anna to introduce you a little bit more to Vector Institute and TKRM and also about the grant. Hi, everybody. Um... It is our great pleasure to tell you more about uh, this this grant that uh, the grant competition that we are running. This is a, a very exciting joint collaboration with Vector Institute. Um, uh, a little bit about Vector. It's an independent non-for-profit corporation that stands for Excellence in AI in Canada. It's one of the three AI institutes in Canada and. Uh, is the only one in Ontario. It's uh, the goals are to strive and drive uh, for the best uh, and top AI um, uh, excellence research uh, and talent and to help foster economic growth and improve lives of Canadians. Um, Vector Institute uh, collaborates and has a lot of partners uh, to drive this advances in AI research and uh, Vector is particularly interested in improving uh, health and healthcare through AI and is uh, putting a lot of effort in this uh, direction and dimension as well. Um, TKRAM, um, that some of you may uh, already be uh, members of, is an interdepartmental center at U of T and uh, with a focal point of transforming healthcare through AI. Uh, to, to me, to, to Jai and I, who co-chair the research arm out of the three ar uh, arms at TKRM, research education and infrastructure to us, it's a, um, it's, uh, it's a, uh, a way to enable groundbreaking research uh, in healthcare through AI. And um, the, the grants that we, we grant, uh, the uh, one, uh, the main PI should be the member of the TKRM. And this is one of the ways to build a community and to let our community thrive. And we support um, our members uh, through uh, events and through uh, lectures and um, other types of um, sources such as the Hivebright, uh, which is a community building platform that TKRM has developed. Um, next. Uh, we are very excited 
uh, to provide this funding opportunity. It's a clinical AI integration grant. And uh, the major difference of this grant to maybe some of the other grants that you have seen or applied for is that uh, we are really aiming to support the translation of an uh, AI model that has been developed already and empirically validated, perhaps in a retrospective setting, and uh, to translate that into clinical practice, to actually show to, as a proof of, of principle, to show that this, uh, this is possible and this is advantageous uh, for healthcare. Uh, the value of this grant is 300,000. It's uh, for one year uh, with a possibility of uh, no cost extension. Um, the deadline for the letter of intent, we decided that uh, <laughs> to try something different this time and not to overburden people up front uh, by writing uh, a lot. So there will be a short letter of intent that Jai will sp speak to the content of. Um, that letter of intent is due August 19th. And uh, after that, uh, there will be a review and an opportunity to present and only later uh, a few um, groups will be invited to uh, the full uh, stage application. Uh, Jai? Yeah, thank you, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, just, just to reiterate, uh, this is very pragmatic grant in, in the way that we're positioning it. It's, it's um, uh, focused on uh, existing empirically validated tools. Uh, this does not mean that you've already prospectively deployed your tool for evaluation necessarily. It, um, but you are going to need to describe how you validated your tool and, and why you think that that's a robust validation um, uh, with the goal then of translating this tool, so deploying it and evaluating it as part of the activities of the grant. As a result of, of this being the focus, you must present a technical integration plan, sort of describing um, uh, how you're going to get your, your tool to the application domain uh, to support the decision or modify the process that you have in mind as well as a workflow integration plan that explains how your tool is going to integrate into an existing workflow uh, to achieve your objectives. Um, uh, you know, as a result of this being a deployment focused grant and a, a grant that's intended to um, a modify uh, some process, uh, you do need to secure buy-in from leadership within the organization in which the model is going to be deployed. Um, uh, we'll specify what that leadership is in a future slide. Please, next slide, please. So uh, just to quickly run over the content of the letter of intent, um, uh, starts with a clear a problem identification and a description of the, the current state uh, of um, uh, process that is intended to address that problem. You need to characterize your objectives, uh, the future state that you envision after the deployment uh, of your model. Um, describe the current state of your actual model and its deployment readiness. Uh, describe your data pipeline, the biases and unanticipated outcomes, as well as anticipated outcomes um, uh, that you intend uh, to evaluate for, the credentials of your team, the budget uh, uh, that you will require to operationalize your idea, uh, and then a closing paragraph, uh, as well as the CVs of the principal investigators. Next slide, please. So just to quickly uh, go over the review procedure, uh, just to reiterate what Anna said, the, the, the procedure is intended to not burden you on the front end. So uh, the content that I just ran through would be consolidated in the letter of intent that'll be reviewed by a multidisciplinary group of um, experts that have both um, AI and clinical expertise. After this initial review, which will occur in mid-September, um, selected projects will be invited to present in front of an adjudication panel in early October. Uh, this will be a, a sort of a standardized presentation, much like a dragon's den for those of you that have been through uh, that kind of procedure. And uh, um, uh, this will follow this standard template and be an opportunity for us to ask um, targeted questions about your application. Uh, projects which pass through this presentation stage will then be invited to submit the full ground proposal. And a final decision, as you can see here, will be announced by January of 2022. Next slide, please. So just to, to reiterate that um, uh, if you want to review this information again uh, in your own time, this, uh, every, all the content that we just ran through is actually available on the website. Uh, this is the link um, uh, to access that information. 
And um, as uh, Anna said, and I just want to reiterate, the LOI would be due by August 19th. Next slide, please. So we'll now transition to questions and, and want to encourage you to please uh, submit questions um, uh, in the Q&A. We'll run through some uh, questions we've already received and, and hope that this will be helpful. Um, uh, Anna, would you like to start? Sure. So this is uh, this uh, session is is being recorded, as you can see. So uh, it will be available uh, upon request, or probably will be posted at some point at the TKRM website. Um, um, the the question is about who will be reviewing the whether it's primary care or community care um, or, or tertiary care. We uh, for the for the full review will have um, the appropriate expertise on the review committee to make sure that um, the the people who are review, reviewing can put it in the context and can comment on the feasibility of the grant, which is very, very important. Um, you should also know that there will be a specific uh, family medicine grant, uh, the, which is running a little bit later this year. It does not have the uh, sort of implementation of this translational focus necessarily. It's more of an innovation grant in the family medicine space. So um, that's something else. It's also a smaller grant. Um, and it, it doesn't matter what area of healthcare you would like to improve. So if it's uh, primary care, community care, uh, this is this is perfectly fine. We we want to see our healthcare transformed for the better. So if you have great ideas which uh, people support, uh, and decision makers are supporting to to translate, uh, all all the better. And it doesn't really matter which which branch of healthcare is uh, is benefiting. Um, yeah. So grants will be evaluated in both AI and. Uh, clinical expertise, as Jai has mentioned. Jai? Yeah, um, so, so uh, this, this has to do essentially with um, training level. Um, uh, the, the question is, what training level um, uh, would I basically be required to have to apply for this grant? Uh, this is being asked by a second year resident. Uh, just, just to be clear, you know, the PI must have a TKRM affiliation and actually must also hold a U of T faculty appointment. So, so students are not eligible as PIs. Uh, the reason for this is, is that this is a, a, again, explicitly sort of translation focused grant and um, uh, we're, we're anticipating that, you know, in order for that to be a successful process, someone with faculty credentials um, is going to be required to interface with the necessary sort of instruments and individuals in the hospital uh, that'll be required um, uh, to get that tool to the application domain. I do want to emphasize though that students are encouraged uh, to be um, uh, co-applicants as part of multidisciplinary teams um, uh, in alignment with TKRM's mission to increase capacity by educating the next generation of leaders. Um, we, as far as uh, topics that are prioritized, there is not a specific priority focus here. The, the real focus here is uh, on pragmatically translating and evaluating your tool. Uh, and articulating a sustainability plan. So this should be a mature application at a stage where you can articulate how and why it's ready to be integrated into, again, the application domain. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of qualifications of the applicant, there are no specific qualifications. Um, we expect that the team will be quite diverse uh, as is needed for uh, integration of the project into clinical practice. This usually would require uh, some uh, uh, both uh, sort of technical AI expertise, clinical expertise, but also um, engineering and decision makers, uh, students as well. So um, the, the, the team, the diversity of the team has been written about quite a bit in this field, uh, sort of um, saying that uh, AI and healthcare is a team sport. So um, this has been our experience as well in terms of uh, bringing something to fruition. So uh, this is probably um, the, 
the qualifications uh, really translate into expertise needed to enable and make this grant feasible. And that's, that's uh, how it will be evaluated. Um, uh, primary applicant must have a TKR membership that uh, I have already mentioned, and um, anybody uh, can be a co-PI in a project, as Jai has mentioned, can be a student, a resident, a fellow, uh, uh, anybody who is uh, who is um, uh, who is a part of this of the team uh, needed to to implement uh, this tool. Okay, so so uh, you know, continuing uh, with these frequently asked questions about the actual composition of the team. So, who should be the PI, the clinician or computer scientist? Um, we will leave that to the teams to decide. You know, I think that a, a close collaboration between uh, computer scientists and clinicians or people with skills in both domains uh, are going to be necessary for the grant to be successful. But uh, in terms of which one of of those individuals is PI, we will leave that to uh, the team to decide and articulate. Um, uh, the next question is is basically about a focused area. Is is are there opportunities for projects in palliative care? And just to reaffirm, there actually isn't a specific focus on an area of medicine uh, during this grant. So. Um, a developed and validated model that uh, optimizes the care of patients receiving palliative care that's ready to be translated uh, and evaluated, or deployed and evaluated, would be eligible for this grant. As far as who will evaluate uh, the grants, there is a, um, a combination of um, uh, technical experts in artificial intelligence as well as clinical domain experts. With, with the goal of providing a very fulsome evaluation of not just um, uh, the model itself, the technical deployment strategy, um, but also um, uh, the proposed outcome measures uh, and, and how they match the use case that's articulated. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the process, um, as I've already commented, the first step is the letter of intent with the content that Jai has uh, articulated. The second step, um, uh, all those who pass the letter of intent stage will be invited to uh, give a presentation in, in front of a panel. And um, those who, who pass that stage will have um, a chance to submit a full grant application. And uh, this is again done to, to spare you um, putting a lot of work in before you know sort of that your chances are high uh, in getting this grant because there's only one grant uh, this year. This is, a, this is a trial, this is a pilot, and we want to make sure that uh, it succeeds. So uh, we will be on hand to, to help with the process. Um, uh, special areas of interest have been mentioned before. There are no priority areas. Um, um, I guess the the point that the the flip point uh, to be made is that this is not a method development grant. So, uh, data science institute, for example, um, there there will be a grant coming up that is joined between TKRM and data science, where the focus is really on method development. Here, this is a mature method that we are looking uh, to see implemented in practice. Next slide, please. You know, maybe just before um, I address this question, I want to address a question that's in the chat. Um, uh, if a tool is externally or previously validated and we wish to implement it clinically, would this be eligible for grant funding? The answer to that is yes. Um, uh, the, the idea is that this is, again, a mature, previously validated model um, uh, that you are ready to implement clinically. Um, and then as far as uh, just continuing with the content of the slide, so we'll work uh, focusing on integration of AI-based recommendations into workflow in the EHR be considered including new methods. Answer is yes. Um, uh, this, this satisfies um, uh, both of the conditions that we were describing. So this is a, an AI-based tool, ideally something that's been previously validated. Um, if, if the integration into the workflow involves, again, articulation of a clear technical and workflow integration plan, and the EHR is the vehicle for that, that would be eligible. Um, uh, just, just wanted to emphasize the second point here, this, this concept of being able to kind of characterize what your sustainability over the intermediate to long-term plan will be um, 
uh, is also required. And then uh, can a rules-based expert system that does not utilize machine learning be considered for the application? The answer to that is no, that is not eligible. Next slide, please. Um, so regarding the details of the budget, we just, uh, at the LOA stage, we are just evaluating sort of feasibility of it. We have limited the number of words just so people don't spend too much time on it. Um, the goal is, is to, uh, to give us a rough outline of, what, of where the main costs uh, will go. Um, if there are in-kind costs, it would be great to see. If you need uh, extra space for the budget and you think it's really important to include, please reach out. But um, it, it, the, the goal is, is just, uh, just a rough outline. It's not, not the, the sort of the tables that you would include on a full grant. Um, in terms of eligible exp expenses, um, anything that is needed uh, for implementation, so including computer technical support, um, supply staff, uh, students, uh, publication costs, uh, etc. cetera. Um, the costs such as rent, utilities, university overhead uh, are not allowed and not eligible. Um, next slide. I think these are all the, the uh, questions that were submitted uh, to us ahead of time. So now is your time. Please go ahead and um, ask uh, questions uh, that you have. And if I can actually just speak to a question that's in the chat that Zoriana has kindly answered, um, uh, just in case you're not monitoring the chat. Uh, uh, the question was, do we need an, a letter from the C CIO at the LOI stage? The answer to that is no, not at that LOI stage. But if you are invited for a full application, uh, uh, then that would be an expectation at, at the time of the full application. You now, the CIO, um, uh, as a sort of a designate at the hospital, was, was um, uh, identified because, uh, you know, logically many of these deployment strategies would need to be supported by a CIO or CIO-like figure to be um, uh, um, yeah, sustainable and, and um, uh, able to be uh, deployed on hospital hardware and moved into some sort of application domain. But if you can articulate um, who else at your institution um, you would need to secure the support and approvals from, if the CIO is not the correct person and you can create a robust justification for why that is the right uh, path for your particular solution and um, uh, uh, support that position, you know, that that would be acceptable. So what we're actually asking then at the full application stage where you're securing institutional support is for you to secure institutional support from the people that you think are relevant and required uh, in order to make your deployment strategy successful. Uh, there is a, another question that came in in terms of what is expected of the validation because we say uh, validated tool, right? What does that mean? And uh, in terms of multiple validation, multiple data sets. So, Sometimes this is not possible, right? But the goal is to, to be able to comment on the generalizability of the tool. So uh, sometimes um, AI tools are tested in healthcare and very small data sets. And um, often uh, even in the published literature, um, for example, the, uh, the evaluation is not done properly prospectively and uh, just done with a sort of random train and test splits and those don't generalize to, to applications. So um, if you're able to test it in multiple data sets, of course, that's always uh, better. Uh, but um, what's more important is that uh, you have simulated the way that this application will be um, uh, deployed in the future on the data that you have, and you have shown that it actually will hold in such a such a such a setting. So that uh, evaluation is very uh, important. Um, and uh, can you add remove PIs or co-investigators 
after the LOI stage, where as you develop the uh, the sort of the the, the concept and uh, you see that you potentially need more people, etc., that's totally possible. Somebody drops off because they uh, leave the institution. I mean, these things uh, these things happen. It's it's perfectly fine. So uh, yeah. And yeah, the next question was, uh, you know, our, our project team currently holds a DSI catalyst grant. Does this preclude us from applying for this grant? The answer is no. Um, the, if, if you look through the full application on the website, one of the things that we, we articulate is, is that if you have additional sources of funding to support the work, um, uh, that is potentially going to be advantageous. You know, what you're articulating here is not just your deployment or and evaluation strategy, but also a sustainability strategy. And if you have additional support um, uh, for your work beyond the funds that are provided, that's certainly not disqualifying and may, may be advantageous based upon your, your application. I actually want to comment that DSI Catalyst grants are specifically supporting methodology development. So this is a different stage of this process, right? We expect the methodology to have already been developed. So in many cases, the um, the DSI grants, I believe, are for one year. So in many cases, you you would be at the completion of the DSI Catalyst grant, right? And and uh, looking to to translate that methodology to practice. Uh, it's just they they are not this this two uh, grants. Uh, uh, DSI Catalyst and the one we are talking today are not supporting the same stage of the process in a way, sort of bench to bedside pro process. Um, well, this is an interesting question. Is it, hmm. is it allowed to use a prototype made by a company of which you are a founder as a tool in the testing? Um, uh i don't see why not i mean the goal really is to trans to to transform healthcare so if this is something that's necessary for testing a tool and deploying it in clinical practice i would say uh, i mean if you are having if you are well funded by a venture uh firm <laughs> and uh, you're get you're also getting this this grant. You are TK, remember, and you're also getting this grant. That means you are taking it uh, the money away from from people who are less fortunate and do not have venture funding. But um, if if this is sort of a prototype, the company is in the beginning trying to implement something. I I, I don't see why not. Jai, do you have any I, comment? No, I, I completely agree with that, and I'll, I'd say that that if if this is something that's very early stage. Um, then you know your your existing sort of forays into commercialization might be a really important part of how you'd articulate your sustainability plan. So I don't think that that would preclude you from applying. I'm uh, I'm sitting here and smiling because I'm unaware of whether or not there's a consensus minimum duration of time beyond which you can assume that everybody is satisfied and questions have been answered. I, I do. I do want to say that that um, uh, you know, if, if questions come up, uh, uh, you, you're always welcome to reach out uh, to um, uh, either ourselves or, or Zoriana, who uh, um, will have be a wealth of information um, about additional clarifying questions. We we're very keen to minimize barriers at the LOI stage, and and are hoping that um, uh, if you're sitting on the fence, that you will apply. Uh, so that we can uh, uh, critically appraise what you're doing and, and try to support it if we can. Um, is there a list of help find collaborators? So um, I think um, we we can we can try to help uh, find collaborators in in a particular area. Area we can we can try, but. Um, to be able to start integrating uh, a tool uh, without any sort of prior engagement as part of the team is going to be difficult. Um, it takes a long time to sort of create an integrative team where uh, that works so well that you present as a single front to the decision makers to say, everybody's on board, everybody's ready. Um, uh, both uh, sort of, you know, uh, computer science, uh, statisticians, uh, epidemiologists, but also the clinicians. So um, 
I think this this would not be a new project or a new team. This is how we envision this. This is this is a team that that is has worked together and is ready to deploy. We have a collaboration hub, and Zoriana can maybe uh, post in the answer a link to the collaboration hub, Zoriana, um, where you can post a question on the collaboration hub for to seek. Uh, collaborators as well. But this is this is sort of my comment was about more about the feasibility of uh, success of implementation. I think one of the important things is why such a grant has come up. Um, this uh, this comes from sort of seeing how much great research uh, in is happening in AI and healthcare and how little of it is actually getting uh, to benefit the patients, uh, right? It sort of stops at the, at the research stage, it stops at the publication stage. And we were hoping that by having the backing of an organization such as TKRM and the community such as TKRM, the decision makers will be comforted um to see that there is a big support from the community to implement such tools and will be uh, thus more inclined to to approve um uh, such endeavors which which really we are hoping there will be more and more of so the question is is it acceptable if a grant focuses on enhancement of an existing rules-based system with ai so if a rules-based system is already implemented in a hospital setting, you want, you want to enhance the system with AI implementation. So I would say that if you have uh, you know, a particular tool that's already working and you have an AI tool that you have tested and found that it will likely improve on this rule-based system and you are ready to implement such a tool, then this, this would be a perfect uh, place to apply. Now, if you want to develop an AI-based system, uh, sort of uh, a more sophisticated system, and you are not sure whether or not it will improve on the rule-based system, then it is a little bit premature, and maybe it's best to focus on a, to apply for a methods-focused uh, uh, grants rather than the deployment grant. But if you have an AI-based, uh, uh, more sophisticated, to the AI-based system that you would like to uh, sort of update and put in place uh, of an outdated rule-based system that is not as good or as efficient, I think that would be, that would be great. Jaya, uh, would you like to comment? No, I think that that's actually uh, a very good answer. I have nothing to add to that. Sorry, um, there is a question about what does grant apply to clinical AI to deploy live in the dark for evaluation purposes? I'm not sure I know what the live in the dark uh, evaluation purposes are. I don't know if you are able to speak up, um, uh, maybe easier to explain, uh, but. Um, do you mean uh, do you mean that it will be complete automation as opposed to inter interacting with a clinician or I just want to make sure I understand the question. Oh, so it's a silent trial, essentially. Oh, the silent question, trial. Yeah, the question. No, so the, the, the you know, the goal is um, uh, that you are moving uh, ideally beyond the silent trial, that you are deploying a tool that um, uh, is ready to actually interact uh, again in the application domain around some decision. Um, in a one manner that can be evaluated against your outcome of interest. So this is this is a step beyond silent trial. This is the prospective interventional evaluation of your tool. We actually had a, a lot of discussion about this uh, upfront. Is um, what is required, and we think that evaluating in a hospital without any clinician seeing it um, actually is is sort of something that a lot of people are already doing. Um, and we want to push people and give them an opportunity to move uh, forward 
and to really make a, a difference with their tools. So like Jaya said, it's that next step to evaluate the actual clinical impact. Um, I think we'll, we are happy to give you a few more minutes uh, to, to ask your questions, but if there are really no questions, um, please, uh, uh, you know, go ahead and submit, uh, apply. Um, if you have any questions that come up after, go ahead and reach, probably best to reach to Zoriana and she'll forward the questions to us. Um, and we will post the answers uh, of the questions that we have already applied, uh, already replied to uh, on the website. Well, okay. Thank you very much, everyone. We, we, we appreciate you attending today and um, uh, looking forward to seeing your applications. Thank you. Thank you.